Good evening. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming to this month's Poem Jam. I'm John Smalley. I'm a librarian with the Maine Library. Uh, before we get started, I want to take a moment to acknowledge our community. On behalf of the San Francisco Public Library, we wish to welcome you to the unceded ancestral homelands of the Ramatush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatush have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place. As guests, we who reside on their traditional homeland recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional territory. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush and by affirming their sovereign rights as first peoples. Uh, in case you don't know, if this is your first time, uh, tonight's reading is part of a series, the Poem Jam Poetry Reading Series, which takes place the second Thursday of each month and is moderated by the poet Kim Shuck. Tonight's program, uh, which celebrates Sinister Wisdom, a lesbian literary and arts multicultural journal, is being sponsored in uh, jointly by the General Collections and Humanities Department, my department on the third floor, and also the James C. Hormel Center on the third floor. And uh, with us tonight is my colleague, Kevin Darling, from the Hormel Center, and uh, he's here to just say a few words. Please welcome Kevin. Hi everyone, thank you for having me. My name is Kevin Darling, I'm the LGBTQIA Center Librarian. And actually this is my first time at Poem Jam after all these years, so I'm excited to be here. This being the month of June, I wanted to take this opportunity to let you know a little bit more about the Hormel LGBTQIA Center, which is the first of its kind in a public library and a big part of why we get to call ourselves the queerest library ever. <laughs> The Hormel Center has been around since 1996 with the opening of this building. We have a reading room and exhibit space on the third floor, which houses some of our extensive book collection. We have over 11,000 titles at this point. You can also find periodicals in the reading room, such as the current issue of Sinister Wisdom. And our current exhibition is a photo exhibit entitled Authentic Selves, Celebrating Trans and Non-Binary People and Their Families. In addition to all of that, we put on LGBTQIA programs year round. We are without a doubt queer all year. We have more than 200 archival collections that are available to anyone from the public to view. And speaking of archives, one of our upcoming events that I'd like to highlight is the Transgender Community Archives Project, which offers an opportunity for community members to learn preservation techniques and best practices from librarians and archivists so that they can preserve their own archival collections. And we all know how important preserving LGBTQIA history is now more than ever. That event is happening Saturday, August 17th, um, 1 to 5 p.m. in the Hormel Center. Please feel free to see me after the reading if you have any questions. And without further ado, I'd like to turn the mic over to tonight's host, Kim Shook. I'm grateful for the Hormel Center co-hosting or co-sponsoring this particular reading. I've got to say, over the last couple of years, um, the Sinister Wisdom readings have been the most fun and most relaxing for me. So I'm really grateful. I'm really grateful to David Johnson today. One of the things that um, I almost never do is hand over booking a show. I book almost every single one of these myself. But for um, these specific readings, I love seeing what a different set of eyes finds in the Sinister Wisdom magazine. So I'm really delighted that you did this. You have a Johnson. Um, I'm going to read the bio, but I also have to say, the first time I ever heard you have a read, I went up and gave her my card and said, I want to book you for a reading, because I love her work. I love her work. I love her work. And I, I also, 
I really love my city. I was born and raised here. I was born and raised here in the Castro <laughs> in the 60s and the 70s, which is an interesting time of shift. And um, uh, I just, uh, I do recall in spite of weird traffic patterns that crop up around this time of year, I'm always really grateful for the expansive definition of who are people in this city in all kinds of different ways. It's imperfect. There's no question that it's imperfect, but it's, uh, it's still better than a lot of what's out there. So I'm grateful to this city. Yeva Johnson is a Pushcart Prize nominated poet and musician whose work appears in Bellingham Review, Obsidian, Sin Scissor, Sinister Wisdom, and elsewhere, explores interlocking caste systems and possibilities for human coexistence in our biosphere. Yeva's debut chapbook, Analog Poet Blues, published 2023, is available from Black Lawrence Press. I can't recommend that book enough. Yeva Johnson. Thank you, um, Kim. I'm so excited. I'm excited to be here. This is the library um, where I had my first, I, I was a Radar Productions Fellow. So the Hormel Center is very near and dear to my heart. I spent a lot of time here and up in the archives, and I see some people I know from that project. The other thing, though, is that Sinister Wisdom, uh, as a poet, the first poems I ever had published were published by Sinister Wisdom. I'm so grateful for that and just so grateful to Kim and to all the readers tonight. We're having an in-person Sinister Wisdom. We do a lot of things online. Check out the website. I won't go on and on because we have a lot of fun things. One thing what we're doing is celebrating issue number 132 today which is entitled, How Can a Woman Who Is With a Trans Man Call Herself a Lesbian? And it's fantastic, and if you haven't read it, you should, and you can get it from the website, get your own from Sinister Wisdom, or you can check it out at the library. Um, what I wanna do is our, our wonderful readers this evening, including Kim, we're going to read some of, um, th not everyone can come here to the Civic Center in San Francisco from all across the country tonight, so we're bringing you, I wanna bring you as much as possible from this issue, little tastes and tidbits, so I'm gonna quickly read the readers we're reading from tonight, a very abbreviated bios that they have so you can get an idea of who, because we're gonna read our own voices and those of others, okay? So just to start, um, Candace Walsh is a creative writing fiction PhD candidate at Ohio State University. She holds a fiction MFA from Warren Rosen College and her work is published widely. Her, chap, her poetry trap book, Iridescent Pigeons, will be released by Yellow Arrow Publishing in July, 2024. Lindsay Rockwell is an oncologist with a Master of Dance and Choreography from New York University's Tisch School of Arts and is poet in residence for the Episcopal Church of Connecticut, hosting their poetry and social justice dialogue series. Her collection, Ghost Fires, was to be published by Main Street Rag Press in 2023. Minnie Bruce Pratt, um, connected lesbian identities, trans lives, women's liberation, and a revolutionary future in the groundbreaking, what I call Shahi, in 1995, to be republished by Sinister Wisdom in 2024-2025. This issue's selections are from Pratt's sequel, Underway, Marrying Leslie. Sarah Sarai brings poems that fuel a long ride, wrote Julie Enzer. Sarai is the author of That Strapless Bra in Heaven, Geographies of Saw and Taffeta, and The Future is Happy. Taylor Christensen is a trans butch poet from Western Washington State, where they are working toward a BA in creative writing. They are the author of two self-published chapbooks. Their poetry tends to return to patterns of viscera, fabric, repetition, junk, the corporal, and women with problems. 
Ursula Dawkins with Alex Nichols. Ursula Dawkins is a writer and editor living and working on unceded Wurundjeri and Boone Wooding County in Narm, Melbourne, Australia. She is co-creator with Alex Nichols of A Thousand Threads, Thousand Threads Press, a collaborative and peer-led writing initiative for trans, genderqueer, and non-binary folk. Thousand Threads Press has produced two books, something, wow, I, I typed it, something twinkles like gold and influx trans and gender diverse reflections and imaginings. So I just want you to help bring those people, we're gonna read some of their writings into the room as um, I start us off with our first in-person reader this evening. And I will read, uh, this is a great, I love these bios. I, I just want you to eat, listen to these bios, so interesting. Barbara McBain is gonna be our first reader. Barbara McBain, gimpy, pinko, kinky, commie, queer, self, graybeard, let's unlabel. But first, let's overthrow capitalism, toss out patriarchy, decolonize, revolutionize, pantherize, reorganize, dream, circle, respeak, repair where we can, and support divine life in all its glorious forms. Let's, yes. Please welcome Barbara McBain. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Come on up, come on up. Now, what I learned, my San Francisco etiquette, because I'm emceeing tonight, all the way to the mic. When you when somebody's coming up, you clap all the way to the mic, okay? So I'll be, I'll be checking on you next time. <laughs> So, well, thank you um, so much, and I'm really so happy to be here. This is my very first uh, public poetry reading. <laughs> so, I mean, I've read other things, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, and thank you for tolerating my uh, anti-bio manifesto bio. <laughs> so, the, the poem that I'm going to read is... Um, this is an abbreviated version of what's in the book because it was just too long, I thought. And I also want to give um, some acknowledgement to my good friend E.G. Crichton, who's here tonight, because this uh, poem was uh, kind of a spin-off or an aftermath of a project that um, E.G., when she was the artist in residence at the LGBTQ Historical Society here in San Francisco, um, directed called Matchmaking in the Archive. So Ronald Veronica Friedman, who this poem uh, uh, honors um, was my match in, in this project. And I just want, E.G.'s written a wonderful book about the whole project and it's really worth checking out. So uh, if you get a chance, go there. <laughs> so let's see if my little light is not really doing much. There we go, okay. Floor map 1979. Can you hear me? Am I? Okay. Ronald Veronica's body falling into gender affirmation surgery. From the rock that anchors Niagara Falls, Houdini Falls. Sounds of ankle bells, shower and peels, a cascade, a cataract, a stream of tears, hits the floor and resounds, a blow on the saturated earth below. That's their head. Water flows to the right, veers to the left, convictions in conflict, that's their torso. Thoughts scribbled on red cocktail napkins, where ink stains spread darkly, Ronald Friedman to the left, Veronica Friedman to the right, that's their organs, their heart. A red sedan hydroplanes through the night, leaving nothing but skid marks in the rear view mirror, that's their legs. Near the roadway, a child grips a, rust, a rusting gate tied in two fists with its back, the butt of its gender, aimed at our camera. It peers into some kind of garden, a luminous pastel pink and blue wash whose precise contents were left to guess. That's their appendix. The gripped gate hangs between stone walls. What is this century? Is it a cemetery? Two stone girls struggle by the side of a highway, their angry words lost in a truck storm. That's their arms. 
soft machine body, two bodies in one, body of surgical intervention, and body of Ronald Veronica thought. That's their clasped hands. A convergence of urges, a divergence of mind, a circle turns in on itself like the curving horn of a goat. That's their tongue twisting. A red napkin flutters down from the height of the falls, a torquing fleck, a small prick of inflammation, a dot in a massive concatenation, a roaring wall of water, of sound. Ronald or Veronica's dropped document maps an old trail of crumbs already eaten through a fairy tale forest long gone. Ronnie Veronica can't even try to go home. That's their hands ringing. A delicate paper entombed in an archive box, or the slipper, or the glove, or the hat in a hat box. These are parts of a body of fashion, or a fashion of bodies draped, dropped, overturned, and falling. We watch and spin as the distance of history turns a tangle of gendered body parts into an infinite knot. Houdini's body, contortable, inescapable, always in question. That's their head aching. Fantasies collide. Far away in 19th century France, Flora Tristan pours over her papers. In poorly lit quarters before stepping out on the stage of public political speaking, creaking, the door to her dark room swings open, then shut, and a bright light explodes. Beyond is what? A blazing sky. That's their handwriting. At 32,000 feet high, Red parachute in place, Flora, or Ronald Veronica, creeps toward an ultimate act of trust, drops into the glowing air that cuts. That's their dream life. A twisting red streak through white shine, a flutter of color, a scarf lifting with wind, trailing out behind, a front-facing gaze, around, down, and stop. A quick impact on receptive ground. That's their fall from grace. Veronica unpacks a large napkin, clean, soft, of cloth. She puts it to work, mopping and mending the flying or falling bodies with their fought over parts and their clashing fashions and throats that open, squawk, or roar, maybe gross messes, either or, radiating splatters and luscious patterns of tissue, ink, and blood on the floor. That's how they end their sentence. So I'm going to read um, two other poems by poets from um, our issue. Uh, the first one I'm going to read is by Taylor Christensen. It's called Slow Dance, and it says, after Meryl Mushroom, Gabriella Cal Calvacoresi, and Eileen Miles. The slow dance was very frequently done in the 50s. Be sure to begin with the general foxtrot trot type step, and don't hold your partner too close unless they seem receptive. If you don't know many fancy dance steps, you can do a simple two-step. Samovar, I said, sounds like a knight. It's just a fancy teapot. Lead with your right hand behind their back while they hold you around the neck with their left hand. Wrap the zero form in broad yellow strokes and wind gauze around their fingers like so. You can begin dancing by holding hands on the other side, your left, they're right, but if they are receptive, you can ease your hands closer to your bodies until you manage to move your left hand around their waist. Drop coins between the tin lover's rattling loud mirror to mirror and wait for nothing to happen. If they move with you, you might want to breathe slightly on their neck. 
blanks my samovar, the steam that makes my cheek glow, so all the women talk. If you can do fancy steps and they follow well, you can use whirls and dips as a good excuse to hold them tighter. This is a good way to impress both them and onlookers. But be very careful not to get out of control through showing off and stumble, fall, or worst of all, drop them. <laughs> My dear, the backpack you gave me has started to rip. Drive that white star painted truck up here and come get your clay cat, your cardboard sword, your envelopes and cartoon gravestones and cereal box hats. And when you're done, throw me in the truck too and take me home. <laughs> And then, let's see, the last poem I'm going to read here is by um, Lindsay Rockwell, and it's called The Quiet War. When you feel words and silence stripped from your throat, when you bare your breasts and smell the no return, when your fragments, dark and loaded, shatter as prism light, and when you finally find the quiet war inside you, it is then your unknown sisters and your brothers call and call. Yes, you, you, you. We see you filled with fear and, and rain, frozen at your final border, the grim and poem of you leaning, calling too. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Please give another round of applause <laughs> as I Barbara. walk away. Okay. I'm not sure if I really believe you, Barbara, that it's your first reading ever, but if it is, it's like keep reading because I could listen to you read. Like, I loved your piece and I could just listen to you read you know, for hours on end. This is, this is fantastic. So I hope you're getting a sense of like the richness of what is in this Sinister Wisdom 132. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on. Carla Schick, who is a colleague, like we've been in all kinds of Zoom readings over the years and maybe occasionally in person, but mostly on Zoom, has been a queer activist for liberation before they had words. Carla says, language came to me through the gift of poetry. She's been fortunate, or they've been fortunate to share work around the Bay Area and in various journals, uh, such as Sinister Wisdom and many others. Carla was a 2023 recipient of the San Francisco Foundation Nomadic Press Literary Award and received their certificate in poetry from Berkeley City College. I am so thrilled to have be reading tonight with Carla and have Carla here. Please give a big hand for Carla. Thank you, Carla, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm quite honored to be reading here. Um, with such wonderful poets and writers and a uh, little bit of story about the poem I read. Just the, I did get my certificate in writing from Berkeley City College. I recommend city colleges and if you don't want to do an MFA and uh, my professor at the place had us look at poems in languages we didn't understand. So, and I read Spanish so that didn't work. So I picked a poem, a poetry book that my first girlfriend gave me by this person named Tuda Arghezi, and he's also Romanian, and my grandmother on my father's side was Romanian, and um, we're supposed to pretend like we understand what they're saying and write a poem based on what the words are in, in the poetry. I want to say that um, my first girlfriend who gave me this book, gave me that book, was also gave me a subscription to Sinister Wisdom, and I was trying to remember what issues I have. I think I have at least as low as issue six. So, uh, and I still have them on my bookshelf because as you, most writers, we save everything. Um, so the name of the first poem, which I wrote, and then I'll read the one that I chose, and then I'll read another one of mine, is called What Beckons We Cannot Always Say After Tudor Argezi's Song. I argue with logic, but no hope, and slide far, far away over a full moon shadow. 
unbelievable lunacy. I build dams from dirt and forge gulfs within us. In the sky, we still hold hands, distant howls, shivering swirls of cloud banks. I visit, pace pathways, unspeakable comrade, touch marbled stone safe in my hand. At the creek, you soak a cloth taken from your grandmother's house, a needlework of lace and daisies. Wipe my brow and rest my face in your cool hands. You wander into the water and reveal your body, beckon me to follow and wade in freezing waters. You seek winter's remains of ice and lean to drink when your mouth catches mine. We wander into a turning, spring flowers bud. If we spoke, the same words would fall from our lips. I squint into our reflections in the tumult of a new waterfall. Birds sing what I cannot. One of my few love poems. I usually write like angry political poems, but <laughs> I can do the others too. Um, the poem that I picked is a cento. It's called Wild and Frail and Beautiful by Candace Walsh. And part of why I was interested in it is because it was based on lines from Jacob's Room by Virginia Woolf. And in my crazy year, 20th year, I decided if I was going to read Virginia Woolf, I would read Jacob's Room, which is probably one of the more difficult books of hers to read as a first book. But it is beautiful language, so that's why I chose this poem. And it's Wild and Frail and Beautiful. Something which can never be conveyed. Uneven white mists, queer moments, checkered darkness. Something in the room. Yellow blinds and pink blinds, pink and yellow lengths of paper roses. Something that would see through them through. A tremulous haze, an 18th century rain. Something about being sure. The oval tea table the mustard on the tablecloth, something flying fast. Iridescent pigeons, cloudy future flocks, a peacock butterfly, something whispers. A collection of birds' eggs, green wine glasses, something must be said. Violets for sale, the violet roots and the nettle roots, something silver on her arm, small smooth coins, sea glass in a saucer, something for them, the flamingo hours, the worn voices of clocks, something like selfishness, the pale blue envelope, the soft swift syllables, something very wonderful has happened. And going back to my last poem, I wasn't going to read this one, and then I reread it, and I um, I thought about that now is a time for poetry. This is a very difficult time, and it sometimes seems difficult to write. Uh, I have been very involved in work around Palestinians for over 40 years, and it is heartbreaking. But it's also heartbreaking for all of us, where as books are being banned and our words are being taken. And I kept thinking over and over again that the most important thing is to write and to say who we are, because we are more than what people do to us. And we have to remember that in our writing, in our lives, and in our work. So um, I decided to read this poem, because it's about not being invisible in some ways. It's called Letter, Letter Written Waiting for a Plane in the Mexico City Airport. This happened a long time ago. It's real. Impossible that I lost my travel visa. I went through my wallet, searched my body for that thin paper, folded into quarters, my signature neat and squared off. I emptied my pockets inside out while pilots and flight attendants rolled by trailing their suitcases, grating tracks of noise on hard floors. I cannot leave without identification. Must turn in what has been misplaced. On the Paseo de la Reforma, 
just a day before, I hailed a cab for you, told the cabbie, ella quiere ir al aeropuerto from the international terminal and left out what you would never say, your desire to depart, wordless hands waving goodbye. You turned back for a second. I saw your face in the rear window, sad eyes following me to nowhere. Now, days after, when I stand ready to turn in my ticket, the woman working these lines of people tries to listen to my anguish. I am invisible without proof of my visit. My name dissolves in a baby's cries behind me, and a mother grasps the edge of her stroller, bends down to tell her child in loud tones, shh, the mother turns, looking right to left, covering her shame with palms that cap, cup her baby's chin, while the woman from Mexicana reminds me, hay un problema, in my going, trapped in my own absurdity, no place to return to, not even home, as she leads me down an endless hallway like a gangplank falling into the mouth of a shark, to a tiny room where I imagine some man will ask me, how can you be so stupid? His lips moving, flickering fluorescent lights, buzzing a raspy radio with signals interrupted and straining to reach me. I hear only silence. No sounds travel across us. He checks the photo on my passport, decides it is a likeness, and hands me permission to depart, a visa stamp duplicate. I am a copy of myself sipping an espresso in the cafe, making it last for hours as I peer into arrivals and departures, worldwide passengers, who gets to stay, who is left behind. I write in my journal poems I will not remember writing and a letter never sent, rising up with the momentum of a plane gaining speed to escape a whirl of mountain winds. I look back at dust and imagine our bodies joined as the twin volcanoes holding hands against what wears us down over time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carla. Um, that was so exciting. I, their work, I love Carla's work, and I'm sure you do too after that reading. That was fantastic. Um, you all are so lucky tonight, because I read the whole, this whole issue. I just had to read it through, but I didn't have all these amazing voices doing it. So this is kind of cool. Um, our next reader is Lily Kaler Honoré, who earned an MFA from New York University in 2024. Is that, I might have, there might be typos in my thing, I don't know, but maybe, where she was adjunct creative writing faculty and the fiction editor of Washington Square Review. Honoré previously received San Francisco State University's William Dickey Poetry Fellowship. A third generation Californian, proudly raised by a single mother in the East Bay, Lily has lived in San Francisco's Mission District since the gay 90s. That's when I came here. Um, and has been published widely. And I'd like you to please give a loud round of applause for Lily Kaler Honoré. Can you hear me? Oh, now it's on. Oh, let's see if I can see it. Okay, well, uh, this is the uh, creative nonfiction microphone, apparently. I'm going to read from my creative nonfiction piece in the issue, and then I'm going to read snippets from two other really powerful essays. So this is from my piece. Um, it's called To Bring More Joy in Life. Um, I'm skipping around in it a bit. What you need to know is that it's a series of email letters set in 2020 about my friend Alex Francisco Cronin. And I refer to Alex with both they and he pronouns. Dear grad school classmates, today our breakout Zoom group had a lively discussion. 
We spoke about the built-in power structure that languages encode and impose upon marginalized people and some possible implications for future writing and translation as languages continue to evolve. How might future translators of English, if the language eventually moves on entirely from he and she, look back and translate those terms? Have any fiction writers explored worlds in which humans are not categorized by their genitalia? My mom posed a poetic question a few years ago when I explained to her my friend's use of they as a genderqueer, non-binary, trans person. Is the they plural because they contain both, both a male and a female self, she mused? Well, possibly not the idea behind that pronoun's newer usage in English, and certainly not true for everyone who uses it, that did fit my friend beautifully. Less beautifully, being misgendered turned out to be a concern which outlasted them. Dear poet, it's quite lurid. My friend left me a phone message, so I knew that there was going to be a body, and I knew when, but I didn't know where. Cue the most ridiculous police involvement, such broad comedy that no one would believe me. And they didn't, I guess, which is why one cop in one part of San Francisco didn't bother to take down a report from me and never followed up. Though it turned out my friend was already in the San Francisco city morgue by then, identified with a different cop trying to locate someone to notify. As I had to make 11 days worth of phone calls myself to find this out, I think our city detectives are not very good at detecting. For further burlesque humor, my friend, Alex, a trans guy who identified as genderqueer and used they pronouns, possessed a California ID that said male and a body that to some still said female. As I got very good at explaining briskly to receptionists searching databases for John and or Jane Doe's. Dear parent, sibling, 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 friend, and friend, and friend, hello, my six closest people. I had had three friends left in San Francisco. Now I am down to two. When I moved into this apartment over 20 years ago, the neighborhood was a swirl with cute young artsy dykes. Just walking down the street was exciting, all of us in bloom together. Not so much anymore in this now trendy corner of the Mission District. The wave of gentrification we accidentally ushered in, everyone knows it was the mostly white broke artists and bohemian queers who made this mostly Latino working class area so palatable to the new tech riche has swept all but a few of us away. I'm melancholy about this sudden 33% reduction of intimates still in my area code. You know, it's funny, Alex had heard a lot about all of you, but only some of you have heard a lot about Alex. Dear Professor, five months ago, a close friend of mine, a one-time roommate who I've tried to rescue many a time, died via suicide. We had known each other for nine years and had briefly dated. My friend struggled with addiction and depression and at the end of their life lived in a van that didn't run with no access to electricity or bathrooms once everything shut down for shelter in place. The gym they joined to take showers, the library where they could have charged their phone, and the mental health clinic where they might have refilled their meds all closed their doors in March. My own door was closed to Alex too. I was too afraid. The new virus spread through air. My friend's drug inhaled in smoke purchased only on the poorest, most crowded Tenderloin streets. They asked if I wanted to get together a game of backgammon, and I said no. In a few weeks, I said, when the stay-at-home order ends. 
I didn't know that there would be no more time. Dear parent, sibling, sibling, friend, friend, and friend, Alex lived with me on and off for three years, first in my bed, then renting the closet, finally on a mattress wedged half under the kitchen table. Alex probably overstated the case when they introduced me to a date of theirs as their platonic life partner. But despite his own problems, and despite an inauspicious beginning when he stood me up on our first date, and despite some fucked up things some of you know about, but none of us shall talk about here, he cared about me a lot during a period in which I would needed a lot of caring. They tried to get me writing again, took me to a poetry group downtown, tried to get me outside of my apartment, sitting on grass at local parks, rec centers, and median strips. Tried to find us both new friends by starting a friend meetup group before that became a thing. Tried to get me dates. There were four successes, however brief, with the butch women they pushed me towards at daytime queer dance clubs and one failure after much plotting with a crush. Through Alex, I learned about the artist Lee Bowery, the Dipsy Hiking Trail, Licky Lee, Fever Ray, Aquarium Care, Begonia Care, what zombies were, that there were dirty videos freely viewable on the internet, how to drink sugared malt liquor beverages from paper bags, how to play backgammon according to more fun made up rules, how and why to give a cat children's Benadryl, and that a chihuahua could actually be an okay dog. Alex shopped with me in the teen girls section at Ross, dressed up with me in coordinating vintage to go to El Rio, wore my spandex leggings, and never returned my pink baby tee. Alex mixed cocktails for the putting on makeup part of getting ready for clubs. I hadn't had a femi friend in a while, and I really liked that they liked me to do their makeup. That this femi friend was also both male gendered, non gendered, and a lesbian is one of the complexities of our modern era. Or, as Alex had me write, in purple eyeliner pencil above the waistband of their hot pink hot pants for the trans march at Dolores Park, gender schmender. Thank you. And now I'm going to read from finding the page. This is from I Was Once a Femme, Identity Now and Then by Ursula Dawkins with Alex Nichols. It's a brilliant long essay, a very writerly meta commentary on writing. She combines selections from her own short stories, her speculative fiction novel in progress in which indeed people are not, well, beings are not categorized by their genitalia uh, and thoughts on her own relation to gender uh, in midlife. Uh, and she also includes uh, letters from her partner, Alex Nichols. So this is just a few paragraphs from the Dawkins. If I were younger, my pronouns might well be they, them. There are folks my age and assigned female at birth who have made the shift. But I grew up in a world where feminism taught me that my gender, my clothes and presentation, my life decisions, my strength, my desires and my vulnerability, all of me, could be part of she, of woman. The mutual support of the historical butch femme couple is what I connect or connected with most as a femme. And that mutual support is akin to what I seek and find in my relationship with Alex. While we enjoy some elements of the mask femme dance, it is being an ally and protector and interlocutor and listener that is most important to me. They teach me more about gender, including my own gendering, than I knew was there. 
I see woman differently now, constructed, not essential, complicated, real and unreal. I see, too, how the feminism that empowered me has often excluded the gendered being. The clothes and presentation, life decisions, strengths and desires and vulnerabilities of other AFAB people. I am still a feminist, and my she pronoun points to both feminist history and my own. The she, her, and genderqueer badges side by side on my chest confuse me a bit. Can I be both? But both positions feel right for me. So uh, please uh, buy this issue and read her essay. Uh, and now I will read from the incomparable Minnie Bruce Pratt. June 12th, 2016. A friend sent me word that the Klan had littered a house in Birmingham with flyers that said, trans abomination, that said, go pee behind a tree. And when I looked, yes, there was the familiar graphic, the hooded man pointing a finger saying, the Klan wants you to leave town, to die said they'd punish mixing black with white. They'd punish mixing F with M and any bi going in between. No mixing, no mixing it up. The power to put a symbol on anything, on a water fountain and say white water and black water. Turn the four-pronged steel handle so the water spurts down like blood from a severed artery spurts up in a sullied arc. The National Committee of one of the two ruling political parties in the US is passing laws to make it illegal to walk through a toilet door if you don't match its little stick figure. Otherwise, they say, go outside into the woods. You belong outside civilization and pee behind a tree. Or the police will come and drag you out before the world with your pants down and your cunt hanging out of your jeans or your balls hanging out of your dress. The power to put a symbol on two doors and say, sheep that way, goats this way, one path to heaven, one path to hell, men that way, women this way. The power to use those words and deny that there is any doubt, any doubt at all about what the words mean. The power to use those words to cut up your body, your dear, dear body. The power to press those words down over our lives, cutting a bleeding circle out of who we are. The punishment when you are someone who can go through either door. The power to look at the two doors and to refuse to go through either. The power and the pride when you are someone who can go through either door and do. Thank you. Please give another round of applause both for Lily and Carla. Those are fantastic readings. It was like a thrill. That was a thrill. I'm really missing Minnie Bruce Pratt. Minnie Bruce used to um, also participate. I never met in person, but participate on Sinister Wisdom online. So it's been a rough thing. So, okay. I am going to uh, read a poem by Sarah Sarai. And then I'm going to read my own poem. And then I'm going to ask our person who's rounding us up at the end, Kim, to read after that. So, um, Sarah Sarai's poem is called A Lesbian with a Megaphone. No one looks twice at a lesbian with a megaphone, except us. We note the curves of her learning. We're keen on her narration of our giddy march down fifth each year in spring. There's value to her learning. There's value to her curves. Precise, with a power fueled by right place, right time, 
and thousands avowing love. The drummer's lady lesbian floats behind are fierce as war. Dyke, 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 march. Oh, they're on cloud nine, over the moon, walking on air, friendly with joy. Our lady of lesbian calls, join us to the sidelines where shills of big fear flash posters warning some god will disavow us. Sure, right, some god that is. Megaphone les lady part words take to the streets, not to battle, but to find a cafe. I really like that one. And I brought this poem, I thought, oh, I like this poem, and um, I thought it'd be fun for today. It's called, Welcome to the Gender Playground, and it's for Mieko Ryu, who gave me the prompt for this poem. The day I discovered a person could choose more than one pronoun, the world expanded in multiple directions, and my panda love found better bamboo forests to call home. The radical magnet, both drawn to and attracting the feminine in every person I met. That feminine, the nip to the cat within, romped untamed but always seen. The dolphin swimmer carried the queer lesbian who held hands with a they-them of me on her broad brown back, and we all smiled free in the sun. When they called me them, I felt so warm inside that ice cream didn't stand a chance because I became a femme with a scoop of neutral on top reaffirming my inclination as a child to choose the gender that, in those days, could wear dresses and pants as the one I liked the best. When they called me a gay man in a lesbian's body, I let it go because the gay man in me was so turned on by those scenes in Moonlight, one black man reaching, touching, loving another, even my gorilla philosopher poet, usually reticent to share, burned up every time we watched it. Old as I am, I learned to repurpose queer, hold the word in my mouth with pride, let shame slowly dribble out the sides to the pavement so that I could become the butch in blossom or the swirl mixed in with everything good, the androgynous of fun expressions. When I took time off from being the girly girl inside the woman who could not share her name, this butterfly post-chrysalis, this bug under the tip of your shoe, I discovered I'm the yes and gender. Look out, it's me. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And now I would like to, actually one quick thing I wanted to let you all know, really important is one, I wanna recognize Allison Blevins, the editor for this 132 issue of Sinister Wisdom, and then recognize somebody who Kim and I can definitely vouch for. You would not be here with us if it were not for her, and that is Julie Enzer, who is the editor of Sinister Wisdom and working so hard to make um, a, a lesbian, queer women, queer people, um, uh, trans inclusive community and, and is the reason that we're here tonight. So I wanted to say that as I welcome up Kim, who I'm so thrilled to be reading with Kim. And we're here in San Francisco, not much needs to be said, but like best poet laureate ever. And, um, it's just a thrill, and it's like especially to be here with Sinister Wisdom and us together like this. Thank you so much, Kim.
And now you all know why I just love the Sinister Wisdom readings. I really do. Um, I'm also going to encourage those who can to buy this book or buy this issue again. Sinister Wisdom's having some of the same problems that every other publisher is having right now, what with distribution problems. I'm just going to say it again. There are distribution problems if you can afford it, buy the book. If not, definitely go look at it in the Hormel Center. So I'm going to read a couple of poems that aren't mine first. TV WSNO on mute at the Dyke Bar in the Sky by Taylor Christensen. Suppose it's easy to slip into slacks fastened flat at the hips. Hook our keys to the belt loop where your ripped out fingers fit, scarred over white under short blood nails. I have before been tricked into doubting I have something worth watching. Doubting floorboards will hold the square toes of dress shoes, goodwill cherries, green beetle shell boots under lace, shirt sleeves, dust blue on pitch red wood. Black me out with a hatch glass and paint me a bitch of bird of snow leopard pin the pewter rose to my collar and kiss me before we step out. 1988 Pontiac Firebird Trans Am Miss Chatelaine broadcast live on the fuzzy signal Snapsburg WSNO above the bar swallowed by being seen. Um, you know, it was interesting. You find out wild things about yourself in other people's eyes. And these are the poems that Yeva chose for me to read. And I just, I don't think I'd ever realized how well she knew me before this. <laughs> it's like, oh, you're paying attention. Every once in a while, it's startling to be visible. I'm sure I'm not the only person in the room who's ever felt like that. <laughs> I Mountain by Lindsay Rockwell. I woke this morning a mountain. What I mean is I woke and found my body to be a mountain. This was unexpected and spectacular. A mountain breathing with four-chambered heart holding raven's sky. I mean, ravens are holding up the sky and the sky is my mountain heart. And though my heart has only four chambers, each is infinite and curious. The first chamber holds all my mother's knees. All my mother's kites, I'm sorry, holds my mother's kites close to my mountain skin, wind and ocean salt. And as the unbreakable dawn declares herself, I, mountain, am now weeping because I am also a body that is human and very small with a four-chambered heart that impossibly pumps, holds the strings, and sees the streamers of all my mother's kites boundless as sky and salt. And let's not forget the stars. Having a strange moment. <laughs> that was that brain fart there in the middle of the poem. I was like, where are my poems? All right, I'm gonna just read one. This is called Between the Wings. Rain, not settled, unpredictable. Some muscle must be trained to support the weight of a full-grown person. Rain and gathering, scattered herstories, these glimmers before evaporation. Poem implies poet. Maybe poem, a pebble, a clue, wings wide on the beach, on the hillside, practicing slow catching balance, another poem, a pebble tossed into water because all water connects eventually because poems are sometimes water, sometimes notes from a distance until the itch between your wings is too great and you fly into a light rain, drops spinning every color from your wingtips. Hang on. So if we could have another round of applause for Barbara, Carla, Lily, Yeva, the AV people. Um, 
Mike and Kenny, John. I have just spaced your name, which is inexcusable. Kevin, thank you. I am so sorry. That is inexcusable. And Kevin, and all of you who came and were audience, thank you for being here.